Hey, Mike Shea from Sly Flourish. Tonight, we are going to do the second Let's Make an Adventure video in which we are going through the Lazy DM's Companion to build an adventure. I've shot a video on this previously last week where we used the sample chapters, the sample pages from the Lazy DM Companion and some of the rough draft pages for the rest of the book to build a single session adventure, uh, a birthday adventure for my, for my wife. And we rolled on a bunch of tables and we did a bunch of stuff. And we got really far and we built a whole lot in the hour that we spent there. But there's more that we could do. And in particular, there's more we could do in the details. We did a lot of the big general stuff of building out the, the, the general seeds of the adventure and what was going on. I think we filled out a good deal of like the eight steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. And we're going we're gonna to review all that today to see where we are. But I wanted to take some time to actually sort of build out the dungeon. Like when we want to fill out a dungeon, what kind of things can we fill out there? And we can also sort of look back at some of the stuff we generated last time and see if we want to take another shot at it if we if we didn't dig it. So this show is supported by uh, all of the fine backers of the Lazy DMs Companion on Kickstarter. You can go right to the Kickstarter and back it. You can also go to the Kickstarter and download the sample at 18 page sample, sample pages that you can use, which we'll be using today. Because we've already done another Let's Make an Adventure video, uh, this video will also serve as a Q&A. So anybody that is in the chat, if you have a question about the book, if you have a question about the Kickstarter, if there's something that you see me kind of glance by and you want more details on like what that thing is or how you use that, this is an excellent time to do it. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to we're going to build more adventure stuff and we're going to talk about the Kickstarter, answer any questions about the Kickstarter. So last week when we were doing this, I built an adventure that I'm giving the very unique name, a name that I'm sure, uh, a name that has never been used, I'm sure, called Dungeon of Shadows. Very, very exciting, very exciting stuff. And we did this through the eight steps, using the eight steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. So for a quick review, who are the characters? What's the strong start? What scenes might occur? What secrets and clues might they uncover? What fantastic locations might they discover? What NPCs might they talk to? What monsters might they fight? And what treasure might they acquire? Those are sort of the eight steps that I use and that I recommend in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master for doing good lazy DM prep. It gives you all the components you need to be able to run an adventure with the, the least amount of time and energy required, time, energy, and money required in order to, to build it. So I used that framework and then I would sort of, I, I jumped around a bit, rolling on different tables to generate different parts of the adventure. And I added one kind of section. I built an adventure summary for this because it's a one shot. And while we were rolling, we wanted to generate that summary. Uh, I have no idea who the characters are. So I just stuck in a table here that I can fill out with all of the character information. When we actually go to play this game, we can fill in these blocks. But the summary that we had and we used to, to generate this summary, we used the adventure generator chapters near the end. So there's these core adventure generator chapters. We, we, we tended to use these tables here. It looks like there's 10 tables in this in these two pages. Very efficient, right? One of the things you'll notice about the, the companion is that we designed it so that every page is kind of a self a, a, a self-contained tool, which means they're, they're pretty dense, right? There's a lot of material we're packing into each page. The core adventure generator had so much stuff, it, it bleeds over to two pages, right? I don't think we have anything that goes more than two pages and almost everything is one page. Your create secrets and clues is a one page guide, which means it's only a 64 page book, but you're getting a lot of material in 64 pages. You're getting a lot of stuff, you know, wilderness exploration, an entire single page devoted to wilderness exploration. So we use the core adventure generator tables, the 10, the 10 tables here to generate the summary for our adventure. And and if you watch that video, I'm not going to describe the whole video because you go watch it. But generally what we do is you roll on the tables and it gives you ideas, right? With these, these random tables are not intended for you to roll and have an adventure, right? These are not, the, it doesn't build the adventure for you. You are building the adventure. What the tool, what the, what the tables are doing is firing off ideas in your head, giving you ideas, making you think differently than you would normally think about your adventure in order to come up with something really interesting. And it really worked out and you'll kind of see. So the adventure was like superior, a superior talking animal ghost, which ended up being a haughty unicorn, wants the characters to activate a crystalline elven obsidian megalith. 
And we, we like this like crystalline obsidian was kind of a weird thing, right? The megalith exists in an ancient necrotic shadow dungeon. And we're like, okay, that's cool because a shadow dungeon could be like Shadowfell. We wanted this to be a Feywild, a sort of fey fairy kind of adventure. So when we see elven stuff that fits that theme a lot, we see shadow that kind of gets between unseely and unseely. There's definitely things we can do. The megalith requires a silvered festering abyssal ring. Again, we rolled on a bunch of tables to generate, to generate these items. A silvered festering abyssal ring to return it to its proper phase. So what ends, what, what, where we got to with this is that there is this unicorn spirit that is whose whose body has been trapped in this megalith that is shifting back and forth between the seely and unseely worlds right between these between light and dark between you know crystalline and obsidian and because it's out of phase the 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 unicorn is sort of trapped in it but the unicorn spirit manages to escape and goes and and asks adventurers please come to this come to this place, you'll have to acquire the ring, which is somewhere in this dungeon. And you have to use the ring to put the, put, to put the megalith back in phase and then rescue me, right? Save, save me. And it's a nice straightforward storyline, right? You have to, you have to acquire this ring. You use the ring in order to f- fix the megalith and save the unicorn. So that works really well, right? It gave us a strong start at the, at the start. The characters are returning from another adventure. We wanted this to be a third level. Uh, I find third level is to be a really, really good level for, for, for uh, one-shot adventures. The characters return from an adventure. They are approached by Ingram, the spectral unicorn who wants her body back which is trapped and that's, that gets into the whole story. We had some scenes that we put together. We knew Ingram meets the characters in the woods. The characters go to the dungeon of shadow. They recover the cat's claw blade. So this was, this was an element. And I, 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 I wonder how we're going to work this out. So what's the cat's claw, cat, cat's claw blade. The characters find out that they need that another being has the ring and needs to be restored. I'm trying to remember exactly what happened, but essentially there's, there's mother cat claw, another being named mother. She has the ring and, and, it, and, and she needs to be brought back in order to get the ring. So you need one item to get to her, you need another item to do the, to, to fix the thing. I have one limitation here, which is it's going to be a three hour session. It's going to be a pretty short session, particularly as a one shot, because it takes like a half hour to even get started in this. Any thoughts on adapting your material tables for other RPGs like Numenera? I think a lot of them could work in Numenera. They could probably fire off your imagination. I think a lot of times, and, and the, the tables expect that you will bring the lore of your own world Whatever, whether it's a homebrew world or whether it's one world or another world, it'll it'll expect that you can bring your own you can bring your own lore to these tables, and that works well. I did it with Eberron a lot. I've thrown a lot of Eberron lore in there. Thank you, Citizen Kane, nineteen forty one, brought up that question. The other thing I'll mention is that Numenera also is built heavily on random tables, and if you look at a lot of the material they have, many of their awesome and excellent products have great random tables for generating all sorts of stuff. Much of my I, I've been very inspired by the stuff that Monty Cook Games has done with Numenera to do a lot of D&D things, including Relics, which I put in here. The whole idea of fantastic locations came because they are so good at building fantastic locations in Numenera. So that, that really works well. I'm kind of stuck with this, you know, this, this second order. I like the idea that there's a, a villain. We did get this from the tables too, that there's a night hag who is there named Mother Cat Claw. And she has the ring. And the idea that you have to negotiate with Mother Clack, Cat Claw in order to get the ring and that she might be trapped too. And now you've got this hag that you have to deal with. I think that's pretty interesting. It's a good angle, but boy, time-wise, it might be kind of tight. So that might be something we work on that we work on tonight. So we have this idea that you recover the cat's claw, cat claw's blade. You, re- you negotiate with mother cat claw. You recover the ring and you, you restore the megalith to its crystalline form and you free Ingram. So that seems like a pretty decent, that seems like a pretty decent approach. And, but I'm going to, I think we're going to want to think through this mother cat claw angle too, but let's, let's go through. So we have some secrets and clues. I think I only have eight right now. So there's room for a couple more secrets and clues underneath the old ruined elven castle, which we rolled on the tables to, to discover that there's outside of the town. There's an old ruined elven castle is a dungeon of the shadow fell, right? The dungeon was built in the service of Preoban. We got Preoban for using our God generator. Uh, dungeon was built in the service of Preoban, an arch fey of undeath. So we use the god generator to generate an arch fey. 
that worked right. Preo Band Sigil, we used from the the same the the same God generator. Preo Band Sigil is a blind crying eye. That's pretty cool. Ronald. So we have this other one about a father. I'm trying to remember how we got to this, but we had a father who had been married to a woman named Carla for decades, but none had seen her. I think we may pull that angle out. We were we were talking about this angle that there's like an old man and he's married to an old woman. The old woman has been a hag. They lost their son. There was a whole kind of subdrama here. I think that might be too much to pack into a three hour one shot game. MTV Junior JR says, question, are all of the books from the Kickstarter going to be delivered at the same time? The physical books will all be delivered at the same time when all of them are available in print. And that is to save on shipping and VAT. We don't want to have to charge shipping and VAT multiple times. So all of the physical books will be shipped at once. Then we're going to be doing the prints for those in 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 different groups because two of the three books, we already have all the internals ready to go. So we're going to get those to the printer right away. In fact, I'm already working with the printer. They already have the galley or they already have the PDFs and they're going to look at those to determine getting the print ready. We're doing all of that in the background, but all of it is going to have to wait. All of the shipping for that book is going to have to wait until the DM, the lazy DM's companion is done because we have to package those. We have to package those together. The PDFs, however, will be going out as soon as the funding gets through Kickstarter and through backer kit and everything else. So probably about three weeks after the end of the Kickstarter is one of, is one that I hope that answers your question. What else? Question. Is there a backer kit or post Kickstarter method of adding more books? Yes, there is. You can add edit during the Kickstarter starter as add-ons, but you can also do it in a backer kit afterwards. Should I simply add extra money to my pledge to get multiple copies of the Lazy DMs Companion? I think you can add it as an add-on in the Kickstarter. You can you can go there and and add it on directly and we'll we'll be able to, to do that. Or you can do it in a backer kit if you want to. Whatever way you want to do it. I want to gift it to a new DM. That is awesome. I recommend it. That, that, that is a great gift. And yeah, you can you will be able to order them from either backer kit or the Kickstarter as you will. That's a good, that's a good question. So this whole idea that there's this old guy and we were going to put it, it's like, we're going to have a village. I think we're going to skip straight to the village. We're going to have unicorn, go to the dungeon, go into the dungeon. We're going to, we're going we're gonna to tighten this thing up into a three hour adventure. So we're not going to have much. Prey Bands Dungeon holds many powerful enemies of the Unseely Fae. It might be kind of fun to roll some other enemies up and see what we, what other creatures are tapped. That's the kind of details we're going to dive into tonight. Ingram is trapped in the borders between the Fable and the Shadowfell and a megalith that exists. Yep, we knew that one. Mother Catclaw holds a ring that can shift the megalith into one world and free Ingram. Yep. Mother Catclaw sacrificed her own son whose spirit is trapped in the knife, held by, uh, in, trapped in a knife. Could they meet Roland the NPC here in I think I think this could work. That that Roland Treason, the old villager who was in love with Mother Carla, he could be here. Maybe he went down here to rescue her. And he knows that she's here, but he doesn't know what to do, right? And only somebody that can figure out what to do with this knife. Like, what would he have to do? So that's a good question. So if we put, we can move him instead of getting rid of him, we can move him into the dungeon, right? And he can become this kind of, tr this, this NPC. But what, I mean, besides gory, uh, obvious things, what could the, how could the knife be rest restore? I don't know. I'm, I'm still, I'm still thinking I might yank this idea. We'll come back to this idea. The, the question is like, how does that, how does that work out? So then we have our monsters. We have the Deadly Encounter benchmark. We're assuming that we would have five level three people. So total, what you do for the lazy benchmark is you uh, add up all of the total character levels. In this case, that would be 15. And then you divide it by four. If they're fourth level or below, they are fourth level or below. So that 15, and then you round it and we'll round it. That rounds up to four. So four, the highest CR is about a four. So how many that give giant rats? That would be like up to 32 giant rats is fits in there, but we we'll probably do fewer than, oh, these are the total amount of monsters that exist in the dungeon. There's like 32 giant rats. There's a pair of ogre twins, Glenn and Krish, known as the, that have the evil eye power because they are, they're, oh, what are they? They're small Fomorians, right? So we've decided to reskin those as small Fomorians. We have ancient skeletons, shadow fell, ancient shadow fell skeletons, right? On oh, Seely Elf Skeleton, I already wrote that. Yeah, so we got 16 of those running around. They have these Shatterkai shadows that are around. We have eight of those. And then we have Mother Catclaw and Night Hag. I forget, is, is Mother Catclaw, is Mother Cat, as uh, a Night Hag too powerful? We are, I think we looked this up. We're going to check it out now. Challenge rating five. So a little on the hard side, but by herself, probably not so bad, right? She does hit hard at 13. She has the one claw, one claw attack. I'd probably give her maybe two. 
Does she have spells? So she has magic missile. I would probably give her like the ability to cast a spell. Like she can hurl magic missiles and make a claw. Would be pretty cool for a boss monster. Those are some of the tweaks that we can do, right? Like, you know, so uh, we'll take a look. So one of the things in the uncovered secrets are monster difficulty dials on page 19. Let's take a look at that. Do -do. So in th this is an example of one of the uncovered secrets, one of the guidelines that are offered in the Lazy DM's Companion. And the idea is you have one page that kind of tells you what you can do to change up the difficulty of a monster. And you have four dials, the hit point dial, the number of monsters dial, the damage dial, the number of attacks dial, and you can mix and match. And this idea of like, you can increase and decrease the number of attacks a monster has for a larger effect on its threat than increasing damage. So beyond just upping its damage, you can actually up the upping attacks. An angry ogre alone after its friends fell might start swinging its club twice around instead of just once. Single creatures facing an entire party often benefit by increasing its number of attacks per round, right? Probably worth mentioning that you might let a, let a monster cast a spell and do an attack, which is what we're probably going to do for the night hag. That, you know, the night hag can cast magic missile, which is great, and it can claw for 13, right? And that's great. A claw, one claw attack per round for a monster that's going to fight an entire group, even when it's challenge rating five against level three, that's not enough, right? But one that can cast magic missile and make a claw attack means that when it's up fighting a melee, it can claw the melee and then it can fire these missiles out and it can hit other party members with magic missiles. It can, it kind of can peg everybody. So I think, I think that that is a good angle. A lot of the other abilities of the Night Hag we're probably not going to use. We're not going to use Plane Shift. We might use Ray of Enfeeblement and Sleep is really nasty. Boy, I've got to be careful with Sleep against a group. It's not going to be able to do its Nightmare Haunting because it's just going to be too short. So probably most of these things it's not really going to get a chance to do. So giving it that ability to fire off like a magic missile is a good one. And I think that that, you know, this idea of the monster difficulty dials is a really, is a really good technique. I, one of the things I like about this, and this is, this gets into questions about like, will this book be useful when they do this new version of 5e in 2024? And I, I, I can't see any reason that these dials won't still be there, that you can still tweak hit points. You can still determine how many monsters are in a fight. You can still tweak the damage dial up or down, and you can still increase or decrease the number of attacks to change things up. So these four dials, which are simple. The nice thing is I don't have to change anything. I don't have to build a new stat block. I don't even have to write anything down. I'll know in my head, I already know. So I think that that can, that can really work. And, and one way that I know that this will work is like, it will work with previous versions of D&D too. It doesn't just work with five. It can work with third or second or first or fourth. It can work with any of the versions of D&D. You can use these same dials to kind of change up the difficulty of a monster. And they're just really easy to do. And that's what we're about, right? Easy, easy changes. Could you build a new stat block? Yeah. Could there a lot of tweaking to things you could do? Sure. Can you just tweak these dials? Yeah. Is it easy? Yeah. And was it going to have a big effect on the game? You know, these could have a big effect on the game and they can do so with very little work. And that's what we love. So that's the night hack. So I think we're good on the monsters, right? I think I, we, we rolled a few times on the monsters to see. We have this idea of relics, right? And so we're going to roll some relics up uh, today as well. I think in the treasure section, what we might do is pull out the Lazy DM's workbook to build some relics and figure that out. I think we did roll on the treasure table. So we have... Some treasure. So really, like I've got all of the stuff in here, but if you notice like fantastic locations, I really don't have much here. So I think what we'll start with is we're gonna build some chambers, right? And the map that I'm going to use is this map right here. So we're gonna do, I'm gonna grab a screenshot of this guy. I should just grab the image, but just for expediency's sake, I'm gonna create the, we're gonna go here. And I'm going to make a new page called Dungeon of Shadows Locations. And we'll just create a sub page. And I'll go in here and I'll hit paste. And hopefully it works. Yay. So I can drop that map in, right? Just grab the screenshot of the map. The book, of course, will come with VTT digital versions of the maps that you can drop right in. So everything is all set. The idea is you have sort of a general purpose dungeon map that you can use in lots of different ways. You can seal off doors so that you don't have to fill the whole thing out. So like this whole back section here, I don't know that I'm going to use that. I think I just might use the main chambers here, right? I'm going to skip the caves in the back because I don't really, so I don't really, I don't really need them. But then I do need to decide what's in there. So we're going to start with room one right here, which is the one that has all these little boxes in it. And we're going to say, what would be, what would be in that room? 
And I like to tie relics, or not relics, I like to tie monuments to chambers. So we're gonna go to the locations, monuments, and items list, and we're gonna roll up a monument. And this is on 1 to 20, and we have a 13. And 13 is an arcane circle. Well, you know, the funny thing, arcane circle is a good one, but I have an arcane circle here. So why don't we fill out that arcane circle room? We're gonna do it in this chamber here. And we're going to we're going to fill out more stuff. So what do we know about that arcane circle? Do we want it? We can have a condition. Let's go with a condition, and we have a ten, uh, a lightning circle. Okay, so we're going to have one of the locations. We're going to go back a page, right? I guess I can. I'll do it on the. We'll do it on this page. So we have location. All right, yeah. And one of the rooms will be a lightning charged arcane circle. All right, so we've got that. We also see that there's this like river that you know smashed through it. This might be a cool, interesting way that do you want to go into the 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 there's two ways in. I kind of like that all of the places are gonna have two different directions in. One way you could get in through the kind of the main central area of the castle. The another way in is that there's an old river that apparently has caves that lead in through the, the cellars and the over time it has smashed through. So I think that that will be a good angle. Maybe there's a different way in here. So in that same chamber, we're gonna add a uh, river to caves, right? So that's a good one. What monsters might we put here? I don't know if we're gonna bother to populate it right now. We can kind of decide what we wanna put there. But this might be, we, we, we wanna think about what, I think this would be a good place where the, where the hag is. Right, that she's trapped here. So it'd be, it'd be interesting. Like maybe they come to her. So this we're, we're gonna put. This is where Mother Catclaw is trapped. Right, and she's trapped in this arcane circle, and somebody has to break her out. Now, how do they break? How do they break her out? We'll come to that. Let's fill out some more chambers. So uh, let's take another roll and see what we kind of get for for chambers. We have a 16. 16 is a pit, right? So that's cool. Do we want a condition for this pit? We could do a condition and a description. So let's roll twice. We'll do condition and description. The condition is an eight thunderous. Okay. And description is, that was a 13. And a 13 is a spired, a spired pit. What is a spired thunderous pit? That's kind of an interesting one. This would be in this chamber here. So first chamber, because we're gonna we're gonna do this chamber lower, right? So we have a pit. What is a pit with spires like? I mean, spires could also be spikes, right? They could be these like weird obsidian spires. But that could be a kind of a fun trap, right? And I don't know. We don't have the let's look in the improvisational. If we look at the improv section, which I think is right up front. We can ask ourselves like, how much damage does this pit do, right? So damage, single target damage would be uh, the challenge rating of the thing. And for this pit, we'll say it's like a CR2. It's not a really devastating pit. So it would be 2d10, you know, either 10, 11 points of damage or 2d10, 2d10 damage on this Thunder Spire pit, right? Maybe we do 1d10 piercing and 1d10 thunder, right? These kind of arcane, what if they're like weird obsidian spires that have glyphs on them and if you fall in, you are stabbed and then they smash you and blow you back out of the pit with thunder. That, may, might, that might be kind of cool. Or what if the spires are coming from the ceiling aiming down at the pit and they're like, what's going on? And you fall in the pit and it hits you with thunder. Which of those is kind of interesting? What do we, what do we think there? What if the spires fire off the thunder which smashes the floor and sends you into a pit? I kind of like that, right? I think that one works a little bit better. So we have 1d10. And so we, we can use that same improv table to tell us the DC of this, right? Challenge rating on this, we decided it was two. So it's like a DC 11. It's not particularly hard. That's actually a little low. So we'll probably do like a DC 13 or 14. DC 13. Is it a dex check or a con? Probably dex. Or 1d10 thunder and 1d10 bludgeoning as you're blown through the floor. That could be pretty cool. Okay, we can get rid of that. So that that sounds like a fun thing for that first chamber here. Now, if they come in a different way, they won't deal with that, which is, this is important. Like we're not spending a lot of time filling out every single room with detailed, like read aloud text and lots of stuff because we don't know what direction they're gonna come in. They might never even go to, but it's kind of cool. 
so then we have these four chambers. So we go th here. I think this chamber right below is the obelisk, right? So we know about the crystalline obsidian megalith. And we that's the so how does the ring work? What do you what do you do with the ring? Uh, the ring, there's a podium, maybe a podium of a skeletal hand, and half of its ring finger is missing, right? So you go in, you have the skeletal hand, it's missing half of its ring finger. You have to place the ring on the finger. When you do, the, the finger restores the, the obelisk or the megalith returns to its crystalline form, and a beautiful unicorn comes running out and says, get me the hell out of this place. So I think that will work. So the next chambers, we've got these four chambers up here. Let's, let's, let's try. And we have like a little cool secret passageway that goes here. Now, obviously we put some things in here, but that doesn't mean they can't change a bit. One of the things you could do is you could, you could say like, I really like that fountain. So we're definitely going to have a fountain in there, but I'm going to change up some stuff about the fountain. Right. So why don't we, why don't we play with that? Right. This is something you don't have to use like random stuff for everything. You could say like some things are fixed, but we're going to have other random pieces to it. So for that fountain room, right. So we will have. What's going on with the fountain? And let's go back to our, I really, really love this core adventure generator section. I think it's super useful and I'm really happy to give it away. You guys can use it right now. You can use it today, right? You don't, I'm, I, I think it'd be great if you back the Kickstarter, but if you just want some cool stuff, this is some cool stuff right here. So we are going to, uh, let's give it a condition. We might even put, we might do an origin here too for fun. So it is a 14, an ethereal, ooh, interesting, 12 is a golden ethereal pool. Perfect. I was really hoping it wasn't grim and dark because I'd kind of like it to be helpful for people. You want to put upward beats. Thing, good things should be in here too. And who might they find there? Let's go with an origin. I rolled an 18. There's a shadow there. Hmm. Guarded by shadows maybe, right? I think that would be kind of cool. So I think that's good for the fountain room, right? Now, these other three rooms, we have some beds and stuff like that. We have some more crates. Those we could actually put some other things in. So let's, let's roll some, let's roll and see what we get for some monuments there. We get 14 is a spire. We got a spire before. Is there any other chamber in here that looks like it has a spire in it? I mean, that's, that's got an altar. These are kind of spires. Let's play with the spire. We'll put spire down, right? Spire. But let's learn some more stuff about this spire. Let's, let's think about some stuff. It is a, we'll do condition and description are always good. Condition is, condition is nine and nine and 10. So condition is a ringing spire, ringing festering spire. What would a ringing festering spire be? That, what if there was like a spire? This is creepy and weird. And there's a bunch, it is circled by giant rats. Maybe four giant rats and a rat swarm and it's calling to them and they're all just listening to this ringing sound and maybe certain characters can hear the ringing but not everybody and it's calling to them and you know they can either leave it be or they can deal with it or whatever they want to do i think that would be really kind of interesting so we'll put that in one of these chambers one of the other chambers let's fill out one of those take a look we got a monument 20 a brazier brazier is always good 13 oozing an oozing colossal, colossal brazier, brazier. That's kind of, yeah, okay, right? So we have this large oozing titanic. Maybe it's got like blue fire coming out of it and this weird black liquid, right? Blue fire and the weird, and maybe this is another prison, right? Maybe this is a prison for another being. What tables, you know what we can do? So we're gonna use one of the other generator things. One of the keys of this is like the generators are all thematic, but you can steal from any of them. And we're going to do exactly that right now. So we go down to the keep, right? And the keep was all about a monster being trapped and that beings had to come and pull up that monster, which means we have some really cool entities that could be here, right? So we're going to pull from this one. So these are some badass monsters, right? These are not level three monsters, so we're going to roll an entity and we got a six and six is, uh, we already have a hag. So I'm going to roll, we have a hellish hag. The idea of two hags doesn't make much sense. So we're going to, I'm going to re-roll that one because two hags, we already rolled a hag. Five, uh, a hunting revenant. So there is a revenant 
All right, this oozing blue fire brazier is that there's a being inside and it seethes. It's this undead seething revenant. Let's learn more about the revenant, right? What kind of revenant is it? So we can go back to an origin. We can go back to our origins. Yeah, somebody says if there's two hags, there'll be three, but I don't want to. Oh, I'm, I'm kind of tired of hag covens. So what kind of revenant is it? We rolled an eight. It is an orc revenant. Cool. Are there tables in here about motivation? Yeah, the villain table. So we will go here and we're going to look up villains. We go to the villain generator, page 15, and we have motivations, villainous motivations. Perfect. So we're going to roll or a quest, but I think we're going to stick with motivations. 19, wishes to prove itself. So there's this orc revenant who wishes to prove itself. That's why. And, and how does it prove itself? Right? What does it, what does it want to do? Revenant that wishes... Uh, that wishes to prove itself. That's interesting. Is that enough? I think that's probably enough. Like, you, you know, I don't need to fill everything out. Like, I don't need a, like a big backstory for this thing, right? I think that that might be enough. I, it would help prove itself how. Like, what, what would an orc revenant need to do? Like, it died, right? And it just became, like, what was it supposed to do in life that it was not able to do that made it what it is? What was it trying to kill? What was it trying to defeat or conquer that it didn't that it didn't do? Not sure. It died dishonorably. Yeah, that's probably good. Died dishonorably, right? Ran. It's a little Klingon, right? That idea of like proving itself in battle. It's a little it's a that's a little kind of cliche. You want to sort of shake that on its head. You know? I don't know. I'm gonna come back to that. We're gonna we're gonna move along cowardice that can definitely see a revenant backstory yeah we could steal directly from lord of the rings right and they 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 are the the one they be, they betrayed their king it, it, it betrayed their king and wishes to restore justice right or maybe it backed what was what you know followed a bloodthirsty king did not maybe the maybe the betrayal it maybe it's the king hunter right followed a bloodthirsty king too long and now seeks the heads of kings, right? And it's trapped here because it actually killed multiple unseelie kings. That's not bad, right? It kills, it kills, you know. You know what would be a good, oh, I've got a good archetype for this. Who was the character in Inglorious Bastards? that killed Nazi officers. And they were like, you know, we've, we've been following your work. How would you like to go pro? Stiglitz. I think that, that, that one fits really well. I really like that idea, right? A revenant, a revenant based on Stiglitz from Inglorious Bastards would be a fun, a fun thing. What would, you know, the blood of royalty would be required to free him, right? So what else we got? We got a lot of things going on here, right? You can see how you can use these tables to build out a lot of, lot of stuff, right? It's kind of fun. So I think that's, you know, is that probably enough for here? We'll do one more chamber. We'll do some quickies. We got to do some quickies. Man, it's too much fun building stuff. Something else they find. 16, another pit. We already rolled a pit. Let's do another one. We already have a pit. 11, an, that'd be kind of cool. Oh, like a, a Shadowfell Ori, right? That's neat. So we'll put that in there. And let's take a look at, so now th those are all those chambers. We have this altar chamber up here. So we also know that there's already an altar. This would actually be a good altar to, this is an altar to the, to, to the God, right? To Preoban. I think that would be pretty good. We could do some conditions though here, right? We can still roll and see if we get some interesting stuff. So let's do some conditions and descriptions. I have a four and a three, a burning three burning obsidian altar right yeah cool one thing about fantastic locations that i've kind of i've, I've shifted a little bit so in return of the lazy dungeon master i talk about the idea you need an, an evocative name and three interesting features i don't think you need three interesting features for every chamber sometimes the evocative name alone is all you really need and i think in this case it's like i have a burning obsidian altar to pray obey the archway i don't need anything more could i add more features sure and for like a big fancy location sure but this is pretty straightforward so that's this altar. Now we've got this big chamber here with all these pillars in the river. So we'll see what interesting thing might be in there. And we've got 
five is a big sc a skull, okay? So let's, what kind of skull might they find? That's an eight and a seven. They find a thunderous forgotten skull, right? That could be a relic, right? That casts thunder wave. So a skull that's able to cast thunder wave once would be pretty cool, right? So in that case, the monument is actually a little bit of treasure. That might be that might be a neat thing that they could find in that in that room. So that is in here. Then we got throne room here. Again, we've got a throne, but we might see if there's something else going on in there. So let's roll the full three. So we've got a monument is a four bone pile. All right, cool. Nine is a ringing bone pile. Uh, a ringing horrific bone pile. Ooh, it's almost like a monster more than more than a. We could do that. That could be some of the skeletons, but also this idea of sort of a bone pile as a skeletal. Is there a bone pile monster? There's that new zombie. I'm sure Cobalt Press has like a bone golem thing. I might take a look through some, I might take a look through some monster books and see what that bone pile is. I'll, I'll put that in the in the monsters section, I might have a bone pile. There's the corpse mound that Intercasso wrote. Yeah, I thought I saw something else. There's like, I guess it's a zombie. Let's do a quick, we'll do a quick look here. Monsters, undead, do, 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 do. undead. And we'll sort by CR. There's a swarm of zombie limbs. So the bone pile, I'll tell you what I always love for them are crawling claws are great for swarms. There's a skeletal swarm from Ghosts of Saltmarsh. That's not, that we could, I might use that. I didn't like that I did one, it's 60 hit points, challenge rating two, plus four to hit for 11 points of damage. Seemed like, seemed a little low. 11 is a fair bit, but two hits, but one hit is, is probably not. But then, I don't know, dress it in plate. 13 is actually fine because it's, it's a bone pile, right? So we might, we might go with that. Let's see if there's any other bone piley kind of thing. But these are all getting into higher level stuff. It's good old Sephic Caltro. Hello, my old friend. It's a vampiric mist. That's not really a bone pile. I think we'll go with that. The skeletal, what was it? A skeletal swarm? That's our bone pile. So we, you know, we'll, we'll play with that one. Let's grab that. Pink. Stick that in here. So that's pretty cool. Do we have, how are we on locations now? Do, 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 do. So that filled out all of these chambers, right? I've got stuff for all of this. I'm not going to do the caves. I'm just going to have, I might, I might take this back alley. I'm probably not filling this area or this altar place. I'm going to cut those off. Those are collapsed. And instead they have, it gives a back entrance to the dungeon. So essentially there's two ways in. Now, will this be suitable? Again, three hours of play and we're going to have to do character introductions. So it's really going to be two hours in the dungeon, right? Which is only, and, and so you have your battle with the hag. You have to assume about 45 minutes for that, which is an hour and 15 minutes to get through the other stuff, which means there's not going to be a lot of time. You've got room for maybe one or two other battles, but not much. So I'm probably not going to use a lot of, of, you know, we don't want a lot of combat in this. So I think that that will be, I think that that will be okay. So yeah, you know, I have to be really careful on time. It's really going to be tricky. So I'm trying to think about, I got that last, that last angle, which is if they, if they meet, they come in here, they find out that there's the ring. Someone else in the room has the ring. They explore, they kind of find out, they learn that the hag has the ring. The hag needs the knife. The knife is held by her old husband. Who's maybe at the altar begging for, you know, begging for the release of his wife. But again, like what does the, you know, what does the, how would the knife release her? I don't want to do it. Like, this isn't a super grim adventure. So the idea of like the characters have to kill her husband with the knife in order to free her. That's no good. But like maybe innocent blood has to be spilled to release her. Would that be, you know, f there might be some, there might be some way there might be some way to tie it in with the character backgrounds. I think I'm going to like leave that blank there and see 
you know, the knife has to cut the salt line. The question is, I, I guess the, the question I'm stuck with is if she has her dupey husband who has the knife and he can't free her, he doesn't know how to free her, right? And he can't do it. The, the party has to do it. You know, what would it, what would it require, right? Like what would it require that the party could do that he couldn't? Is, is a is a tough is a tough question maybe he knows maybe it is like you know cut the salt line but he's, he, he's like you know i know she's my wife and i love her but i but something really bad is going to happen if i let her go like maybe he knows deep down right he knows this stuff that's that could be kind of a fun angle he's down there he loves her but he can't do it and she can't get him to do it and so the party has to decide and they say like well we can release her i think that could be kind of interesting so I think we'll leave that. that. That's kind of a fun bit of role play stuff to, to figure out. So I think we'll leave, I think, I think that we'll leave that idea, right? We can put that in the, in the that can be a secret, I think. So we decided that the, the, Ronald, the Ronald angle is okay. This idea, he's never seen her. He loves her, but knows that freeing her will be bad. He can't get himself to free her. Yeah. And maybe he's like begging at the altar to pray Oban, you know, to save her, right? Hopes to ch change her to a mortal woman. Hopes to get pray Oban. Pray Oban doesn't listen, right? So maybe he thinks that, you know, there's a way, there's a way to convert her. And maybe there is, right? Maybe she can't be saved. Maybe like you, if you defeat her, you perform this ritual, maybe one of the characters knows that there's a ritual that can kind of return her to what she was before she herself became a hag, right? That she she grew up like other hags. She was a mortal once and a hag kind of changed her, but she can, she can return to what she was. That could be interesting, right? What was it, 1800 years ago? No, 900 years ago. 900 years ago, Mother Catclaw was a woman... Uh, yeah, a woman named Carla. I think that could I think that could work. We'll see. Some sometimes you put ideas in here like this, and then you play the game, and while you're running the game, a different idea shows up and you can grab that idea. You can grab it from you can grab it from players, you can grab it from all sorts of places. And so I've got some relics in there. So we are at an hour. Man, it flew by. I hope you enjoyed it. And I think I think we were able to have some fun looking at how to use the map here and fill out some room descriptions using the tables from the Lazy DM's Companion. I tell you, like this, these tables here, the location, monument, item, condition, description, and origin tables, really great table. Let's, let's do a relic. Come on, let's have some fun. We'll do two. So I'm gonna roll two different relics, 13 and 17, a brooch and a monocle. Okay, let's go back to my relic. We're gonna make two. And let's go back and learn some stuff about this. For the brooch, it is a, a lightning, a spired lightning brooch. What's the origin? It's a 19. A spired lightning brooch ethereal. Spired lightning, that's a lot of things. Spired ethereal lightning brooch. The fact that this could do maybe a lightning bolt once, that's pretty cool. All right, that fits the theme. Maybe it's from the elemental plane of air. That's pretty cool. How about this monocle? Let's learn more about this. We'll roll 3d20. Seventeen, seventeen, sixteen. Drowned, a horrific drowned unseely monocle. What is up with that? Horrific drowned. Horrific Drowned Unseely Monocle. Maybe this can do a turn undead once. DC 14, right? It's the monocle of a drowned, I didn't spell monocle right, apparently. The monocle was submerged. I don't know about the drowned part of it. Maybe it was like from a, you know, somebody who drowned, right? The, the monocle was aboard someone who drowned and it captured it and it's, and it's still kind of, you know, there. Obsidian Dungeon of Thunder and Lightning, it sounds like. Couple of relics. I don't know where we'll drop those in. We've got gold, gems, etc. cetera. Why, why didn't we fill that out? How come we didn't get some treasure in here? Let's go to our treasure generator. Where's our treasure? Is that the right one? 
Yeah, let's look at some treasure. So we have, this would be first to fourth level. We'll go high. 175 gold pieces worth of stuff, right? Nice and easy. You could split that into a few different parcels. So uh, 175, let's see, is what? How, what's, what's a quarter? How does, what, what divides evenly into 175? Math is hard. About 44 gold, right? Or you just mix it up till eventually you get, you know, you get some parcels. So maybe you have 250 gold piece because you don't want each parcel be, to be perfectly matched. So you just, you just throw gold out until you hit 175. And that's about right for, you know, a, a dungeon. One shot, it doesn't really matter anyway. So I think I rolled Instrument of the Bards. I really don't like Instruments of the Bards. They're, they have too much stuff going on. That would be too complicated. So we're going to go with a different, we roll another treasure here. That's a D100 table. Ooh. 29, 29, uh, 29 is plus one ammunition. So we will throw some plus one, a bundle of plus one, plus one ammo, which is boring, right? So guess what we do to spice that up? Conditions, description, and origins. What kind of weird arrow, what kind of weird projectiles are these? A 20 silvered, cool. 17 horrific silvered. Who made them? Nine. Goblinoid. What kind of projectiles? I'm not sure. I'm going to see when the characters come in. And I'm not going to put crossbow corals if somebody's not using a crossbow. They could be hand axes, maybe. Maybe a couple of plus one horrific silvered goblin hand axes. Maybe they would be javelins. Maybe like a plus one javelin. But, but probably arrows or something like that, right? Some A small, they could be daggers, some kind of, I guess it's supposed to be ammo, but I'm going to go with like light weapons or ammo, right? I think a pair, a pair of these things might be cool, but I'm going to darts, horrific silvered goblinoid darts. What are those like? They scream when you throw them. Ah! And maybe they do a fear effect when they hit. That could be kind of cool, right? I don't know. Could, could be kind of neat. We'll do that instead of the instrument of the bards. I think it would be cool to have like another permanent magic item though. So I'm going to, I'm going to roll again and get something other than it. So let's roll one more time. I could just keep sitting rolling on tables all night. 73. Figurine of Wondrous Power, Silver Raven. And again, this treasure table is going to change. Oh, I already have that one. I rolled, I rolled that one before. 70. I'm getting pretty close to the same number again. Eyes of Minute Seeing. I actually rolled those for another group. But that, that could work. Oh, look, I got tabs in there. It gives you perception check when you're checking on, uh, checking on. So that's pretty cool. So how do I feel? I certainly have a lot more stuff going on in here. That, the, the hardest part for me in thinking about this adventure, the thing I'm most worried about is getting to run this whole thing in three hours. That's going to be, that's going to be tight. And I'm going to have to move them along. So I might even try to ask and say, hey, in order to run this, could we, any chance we could start an hour earlier and that way we could finish. So I'm going to, I'm going to try that. So we're going to see. But yeah, so I think that was a lot of fun. So once again, if you like what you have seen, in this video, you can back the Lazy DM Companion Kickstarter. The Kickstarter is, let's see, the links for it, of course, are in the show notes. Uh, show notes below. We have seven days from the recording of this video before the before the Kickstarter is complete. It's been doing very well. Almost eight thousand people backing it. That's crazy. Eight thousand. Thank you so much. And you can go right here to the seventeen page free sample. Click that, and you can get the PDF that includes all the things I was just using. But you can back it and get the entire book, sixty four pages of stuff like this. So I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed this video. For all my friends hanging out here on Twitch, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. It's had an excellent time. Really looking forward to it. And we will see you guys next time. So thank you all very much. Have a great day and get out there and play some D&D.